and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who believes in the magic of the cup. His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. Hello. Of course I do. Of course I do. <laughs> in that most of the large teams won and most of the small teams did not. But yes, well, I mean, otherwise, yes. Arsenal fans would disagree. <laughs> That's so true. We're going to do our, most. Yeah, we're going to do our FA Cup third round review in the, the traditional, now mm. traditional, thumbs up, thumbs down uh, method. Yeah. Um, I, I've got to say... Uh, I started with Magic of the Cup because I kind of, not not so much the giant killing stuff, but more just my belief in the FA Cup was, uh, it was it came back to me uh, watching the soccer this weekend. Why is that? Just because I enjoyed it. Like, you know, a lot of times you'll watch the FA Cup and be like, ah, oh, and you uh-huh. want the Premier League to happen instead. I think there's been so much Premier League um, over the festive season. And then along comes something different. You know, that, that Arsenal Forest game was exciting. The Liverpool Everton game was exciting. Mm-hmm. Even Man City Burnley had its own, its own weird first half, second half charm. I mean, I agree <laughs> you know with mean? you. I think, I Wolves, stand by Wolves my. Didn't t- lose. That's true. I stand by my tweet that I wrote earlier today, which is basically the FA Cup, like can sometimes be referred to as the "Oh yeah, they have that guy" <laughs> cup because there is a lot of that are happening. You, so you talking about the big teams rotating, and you're seeing their sort of second string players, or are you talking about the Championship and League One teams where you're like, "Oh, that's where he is." Yes, the second one. I mean, it's, no, it's both. Ah, it's okay. both of them. It's definitely like, oh yes, Stoke have. Who did they pull out? They pulled out uh, Charlie Adam and they pulled out uh, Stephen Ireland. It's like, oh, yeah, those guys are still paid by them. Like, you have those moments of like, oh, yeah, them. But then also, yes, you have the, the players in the championship in League One that yeah. you kind of forgot about. And you're like, oh, yeah, scoring goals. That's right. <laughs> and you learn about new players. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that Des Walker's son was playing for Nottingham oh, really? Forest. That really excited me to see that this weekend. Yeah. Well, I always, I always forget that uh, Zach Clough plays at Nottingham mm-hmm. Forest. And he's not that, related. Like, oh, right. Yes. And he's not yeah. related, which yeah. must be a weird experience for him. I would say so. Yeah. Because I always have that like, oh, it's because he's dead. Oh, wait, right. Yeah. No relation. <laughs> I don't know anymore. Shall we get going then? Sure. I, I would invite you to start, Tyler. Where do you want to do your, your thumbs up or thumbs down? I mean, we've alluded to Nottingham Forest and Arsenal a it's lot. It's kind of a headline game, there. isn't it? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Nottingham Forest four, Arsenal two. I'm yeah. going to say thumbs up to Eric Lehigh for being an American hero. Oh, I've got thumbs up to Catherine Lehigh if she lets Eric get a dog. <laughs> yes, so he uh, he said basically his wife told him that if he scored a hat trick at any point this year, they would get a dog. He had the brace. Uh, uh, Nottingham Forest got the late penalty. He wanted to take it yeah. and apparently was told not no. politely told no <laughs> by his teammates. But he did get the brace, and I'm sure he'll be satisfied with that. But will he get a dog? And I think there was like a, a hashtag trending on Twitter of like, get Eric a good boy or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's become kind of high profile enough. Like a lot yeah. of English media were tweeting it out and you know talking about it. Yeah. I think she's going to have to cave and let Eric get a dog now. We'll see. We'll see. I would hope so. <laughs> I hope so. All right. So, um, sorry, I interrupted you with my with my dog thumbs. What what were you going to say about? Eric I was just going to say that you know he was the American hero on the day because he has the first goal, which I like. I was so distracted by the way the goal was scored and mm-hmm. how strange it looked that it took me a minute to realize. Like, wait a minute, I recognize that face that's smiling and celebrating. Oh, it's Eric Lehigh. And then he gets the second goal, which is a lovely if you haven't seen it outside yeah. of the foot volley from like nineteen twenty yards out. Yep, uh, chest he, and volley. It's a classic yeah, chest and volley. I mean, it was real pretty, and it mm-hmm. took a lot of people by surprise, and at least the commentators who lost their minds. <laughs> Did you see? Um, Bobby Warshaw had a good sort of mm-hmm. quick analysis yep. tweet of he turns his toe slightly inwards, which lets him sort of get that yep. outside of the foot just a little bit of outside of the foot right she gives it just that bit of spin yep lovely 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 it spin. still had in the same way like when we watched Christian Pulisic dunk or, or like last week that we're <laughs> sort of like the mechanics are still sort of awkward it's like watching yeah, yeah. like a basketball player try to play soccer like uh-huh. there's, even if they're good there's still those moments of like this isn't quite as comfortable as it is playing another sport it felt like that with Lehigh where it's a really good finish and you can see he's doing all of the mechanics right but there's still just a little bit about it that isn't completely natural to him I think he's <laughs> more, much more at home slide tackle like well, the ball. he had a, that long ranger in the Gold Cup, That's right, true. for the United States. Mm-hmm. So it's not as if he's sort of uh, not not scored from distance before. This is true. Yeah. This is true. But yeah, thumbs up to him certainly for the two goals. I've got thumbs up to Lee High for that first goal for spotting the major flaw Let's talk in about Arsenal's it. defensive plan. So if you follow us on Twitter, you've probably seen this because I screenshotted mm-hmm. it. The reason Lehigh was essentially able to be right in Ospina's face, right? Yeah. He runs across the front of Ospina um, to meet that free kick that that comes in is that Arsenal seem to be playing an offside trap, right? All their defenders, almost all their defenders, are lined up at the top of the six-yard box holding an offside line. Mm -hmm. And yet, Maitland-Niles, the left-back, and Theo Walcott um, have got a defensive wall Mm -hmm. um, in front of Kieran Dow uh, to try and block the near post 
essentially meaning no one is offside right. because they're deeper than the rest of the players. And yeah, no I mean, one has spied this. You would have to work very hard to be offside because I think there's like a <laughs> half yard between the left foot of right. the wall and the end line. So I guess if Lehigh <laughs> were standing there, he's offside. But outside of that, yep. it's pretty difficult. And the reason I know that Lehigh knows exactly what he's doing mm-hmm. is that when he um, he runs to time it so that when Dal takes the free kick, he is, he is at that moment just breaking the plane mm-hmm. of offside, right? Because if he um, had been in the spot that he ends up, which is basically at the near post in front of Ospina, he would have been offside if he'd started there. Yep. He knows exactly what he's doing. I think he does. And I think uh, you pointed out, what, that there's like you can see a lot of different like, moments of communication where yes. people are kind of figuring out, hey, this marking strategy this is maybe to our advantage. Right. Yeah, so there's some good communication from Nottingham Forest, right? As Dow is standing over the ball. He's on loan from Everton, by the way, yep. um, Everton fans. Um, you see the 18-year-old centre forward, uh, Ben... Brereton. I've always mm-hmm. had trouble pronouncing his name, right? I think it's because the commentator said it so fast that it sounded yeah, yeah. like I didn't think he was English because like it was like Ben Brereton. Yeah. It was just like, oh, <laughs> that sounds like a weird combination of but things. But yeah, 18-year-old English striker. Mm-hmm. He comes jogging over, sort of does that thing where he hides his mouth, sort of says something in Dowell's ear as Dowell is standing over the free kick. Yep. Then he jogs back and he has a word with Lehigh and then, just before the free kick comes in, Lehigh runs behind that line at the top of the box. Yep. Debushi is the guy who was theoretically, I think they're zonal marking, so he's not man marking him, but he's the guy that should have spotted, oh, something's wrong here. And he does, but by the time he spots it and reacts, the ball's in the back of the net. Uh, a Lee couple, a couple of things here. First of all, like I, I'm not taking issue with you saying they're zonal marking. I'm taking issue with the idea that if they are, in fact, zonally marking, it is so stupid. Because <laughs> because by the way they're doing it, as you pointed out, like it looks like they're trying to keep an offside line, mm-hmm. which means that if you're trying to get to your zone to then attack the ball within your zone, you first have to get to your zone. You're not really being that proactive mm-hmm. in your defensive approach, so that doesn't really make any sense. To try to give Arsenal credit here or to try to try oh, to figure oh, out... I would say maybe the zone of the six-yard box yeah. theoretically is then Ospina's, right? That, so everybody stays out of Ospina's way yeah. so that his zone is there. So I think that would be be the most logical mm-hmm. defense is that it's yeah. supposed to be And no be one can get right in front of us being because they'd be offside, right? They're not. Well, see, that's but that's where I think it doesn't make any sense because if you're trying to give Ospina the entire box, he's then worrying about a shift ball to the back post, a driven ball to the near post, a low ball in the middle, a high mm-hmm. ball. And, like He has to cover so much ground and worry about so many things. That doesn't make much sense to me. The only other thing I can figure is that Arsenal have like different defensive schemes or like plans for when you have a set piece in a different like position and all I can think is that maybe they had practiced a set piece that was maybe like six yards further out yeah, from yeah. where this one was and so they were like oh if you're 12 yards out now you hold the line the walls in front now that makes a little more sense mm-hmm. but I just wonder if maybe they didn't ad- adjust it to this position yep. when you're never going to catch anybody offside I agree and I think it just looks like the, that uh, Walcott and Nathan Miles and then the defensive line and Ospina um, no one is sort of put two and two together and realize that these two things that we're doing, they can't happen at the same time because yeah. one thing negates the other. Ospina definitely doesn't spot it because the, there was a close-up of him uh, shouting to his wall and pointing left, yep. left, left, trying to get them to come and cover even more of the near post, yeah. right? So, yeah. this, I mean, you can argue it's a lack of leadership for Arsenal. I'd say Per Metasaka as the most senior player more on um, in that back four, Surely. he absolutely yeah. should have been the one spotting this, I think. Well, then, but, but also then, Ospina because he's the goalkeeper. He's the only one who's really like could have his head on the swivel to see both things. Well, but if he is trying to take them from the left and then that means he is trying to cover that near post, mm-hmm. which maybe then... Because then but then the only, he should turn around and say to his defenders, oh, wait, we can't catch them offside. Yeah. Guys, fall back, fall back. Yeah, so it's definitely a lot of mistakes leading to this one. Mm-hmm. And I think this is probably the one that a lot of people will focus on because that image that you tweeted... It's kind of hilarious in that it absolutely looks like Arsenal are trying to keep a high line and forgetting that they have three people behind them. Uh But there were so many things wrong with this Arsenal performance. And Arsenal fans, (laughs) I hope this is more an opportunity for you all to be like, yeah, that was really frustrating. Then it comes across as us just being like, and this was bad and this was bad. But I was like... But I feel like we've hit a specific thing here, right? Well, it's probably emblematic of their whole problem on the day. But I also have like... like, I, I. Went back and forth on how to phrase this, but I ended up with, like, thumbs down to Arsenal's center-back duo. But I was initially toying with, like, thumbs down to Arsenal for, like, basically playing down to an opponent. And I don't mean that, like, Nottingham Forest are, like, wildly inferior and Arsenal just... But it felt like stuff that they know wouldn't work against a Premier League opponent. They tried to do against Nottingham Forest and Mm. maybe just thought, they're a championship side, they won't be able to figure it out, or they don't have the technical ability. For example... 
We know Per Mertesacker isn't fast. It's one of the things we've talked about time and time again with, with Arsenal. Why are you trying to play a high line with him? You know it's not <laughs> going to work. They got beat like four or five times in the first half by just long balls over the top yeah, yeah. because the Arsenal back line was and just say, out of position. I'd give real credit to uh, Ben Brereton, right? Yeah. He's never played against like the level of play that mm-hmm. Per Mertesacker is, right? World Cup winner and all that. Um, he really... Um, I mean, obviously, if you're faster than someone, then there's that mm-hmm. obvious advantage. But he did a lot of really good stuff where he just kind of held up the ball and took pressure off of the off of Forrest when when the, you know Arsenal seventy percent possession. Yeah. So when Forrest did have the ball, it was really important that he was an outlet who yep. the ball would stick to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he did a, he did a great job for an eighteen year old centre forward. But I think he definitely did, as did a lot of the other Nottingham Forest attack. But I think they were also given a lot of opportunities. I mean, you go to Lehigh's second goal, the, mm-hmm. the really good the volley, volley, but it comes about because Arsenal kind of failed to clear in the first place. We could talk about who initially fails to clear, but yeah, the yeah. second one is Rob Holding yes. with a the type of header that if somebody in our local CVSA league did, they would be subbed out yeah. by their own teammates for being like, come on, <laughs> like you can't have a headed clearance go to the top of the 18. Yeah, yeah. In a, he like, just loops it up and hard. And right? it's just so like tantalizing the way that one is headed clear that if you any player, any opposition player is going to see that ball and just instantly think of all of those like perfectly struck volleys that you've seen on montages and just like, yeah, this yeah. is my chance, and hit it home. From now on, people will say, I'm going to Lehigh this. I like that plan. <laughs> and then, not just that head, head and clearance, but then also uh, for the third goal. Oh, sorry, can we, can we talk about the guy who sets holding well, up? I just wanted to add that the third goal is also Rob Holding once again, oh, just being it? sloppy in the box. He does that thing where he like has a bad settle, then he thinks he has time, and when he goes to touch the ball, the ball is gone, but he gets the guy. Yeah. So it just felt like Arsenal sort of not being up for the opponent. Mm-hmm. And that's not just limited to the Ar- Arsenal center backs, though, I should add. Yeah. All right, so yeah, Theo Walker. Yeah. You got mm-hmm. it. We've got to look at him, right? He's one of the sort of... Uh, more experienced, bigger names that was uh, that were on the field today. Yeah, right. It's his sort of weird defensive header from the right side of the six yard box. He essentially pops it back into mm. his own. It's almost like an attacking header, right? Yeah. And, and then holding has to kind of clear as best he can given the circumstances. If you if you rewatch this, because obviously Lehigh's volley gets all the attention, but if you watch the four seconds beforehand, mm. it's almost like they're playing volleyball and like Walcott is spe- uh, setting holding up to, to sort of just lift it over the net. Yep. You know what I mean? That's mm-hmm. the sort of the pattern of play that you see. Yep. Really ask him for it. I mean, it... it- I have to think, believe that like Arsene Wenger is maybe a little bit thankful that uh, Stoke, more on them later, also lost because Mark <laughs> Hughes is now out of a job. Yeah. And I do think if Stoke had won, I think there's a lot more attention on this Arsenal I mean, loss. And it led our show, right? Yeah. And but not I mean, accidentally. It but was it the just, thing I wanted to talk about the most. It feels similar. It feels like a manager who's been there for a very long time. Yeah. Uh, what was, uh, up until his firing, Mark Hughes was the second longest tenured manager in the Premier League right? behind Arsene Wenger. Mm. Uh, so yeah, it, I think that says more about the Premier League than Mark Hughes. Uh, it certainly does. <laughs> but in this situation, I'm just saying it felt like like I, I just I feel like I would struggle to name you an Arsenal player who looks like they are just happy to be there and happy to play this season, aside yeah. from the youngsters who are excited to get minutes and yeah. get some kind of first team opportunities. But when you have so many youngsters, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I'm all about hashtag play your kids. Yeah. But when you have so many youngsters, you do end up with players who don't have the experience yeah. to spot things like what happened mm-hmm. on the first goal, right? Yeah. Like Willock and Maitland Niles. I think they're going to be. Uh, N- did Nelson play? Reese Nelson, I think he played yeah. as well, oh, right? Yeah. These are going to be very good players, but they're also kids, right? now who you can't necessarily expect to uh, to spot what we saw I will say slightly in defense of Arsene Wenger all right and so be, mm-hmm. I, I don't want to get the wrath of Arsenal fans here but he was dealing with something of an injury crisis right every big team kind of rotated after the festive period where you played four games in however mm-hmm. many days so there's a bit of rotation going on but then on top of that Arsenal had a bunch of players injured as well mm-hmm. right like Giroud uh, probably would have played in this and Shaka I've got a list somewhere I think Monreal the, uh, lots and lots of players who kind of could have been rotated in mm-hmm. uh, were not able to so I think Wenger had to go like one level deeper into his squad it's uh, not the best excuse but it is like an extra reason why it happened well it's the Wenger cycle because then it becomes <laughs> like but if you uh, you know you're going to have injuries you know you're going to have the festive period with a lot of congested fixtures yeah, yeah. sign some more players in the summer sign mm-hmm. some more players when you have an opportunity to do so to strengthen your team yeah. don't sign a 20 year old Greek player who you maybe are going to keep but maybe going to loan back <laughs> out we're not sure that's not really going to help you in these types of matches yeah. I would say matches that you need to win because it's an opportunity to get some silverware at a time when yep. it's looking like maybe top four is going to be difficult it's mm-hmm. certainly going to be competitive at the very least so you got to be stronger didn't I text you I guess they focus on the Europa League <laughs> maybe, maybe that, pro- that maybe really is the Europa League is going to be this thing where there's going to be one big team every year yeah 
their, their season's in trouble and now they have to really like double down and focus on the Europa League. Yep. That could be Arsenal next year. I mean, this year, sorry, it's 2018, isn't it? It could be Arsenal the second half of this season. That could make the Europa League more exciting. So does that. I think, I think it's going to make the January window, if not more exciting, then certainly more tedious. Because I think <laughs> you're going to start to see those articles about Mesut Ozil and Alexis Sanchez. We're very frustrated to see the team dumped out of the FA Cup and that's one fewer competition for them to be involved in. Yeah. Maybe they're looking elsewhere. And I think there's going to be a lot of stories. There already were going to be, but I imagine this loss doesn't help with the number of stories about Sanchez and Ozil wanting moves away. All right. Final word we should give to Nottingham Forest. Yeah. Because they sort of were the team of the moment. They did have a sort of brief move the ball around mm-hmm. Ole type uh, moment. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Um, which actually I think ended with Lehigh playing the ball down the line <laughs> and losing it after they That's put 10 or so right. passes mm-hmm. together. Um I w- I'm really excited to see this team again. So um, whoever they draw in the fourth round, which I think happens Monday afternoon, will know who Nottingham Forest get in the next round. If they have another big team when fourth round weekend comes, that's the game I'm going to be sort of making sure to watch. I'm down. Yeah? I'm down for that. Because I think there's a lot of players fun, that, I, man. that I really like the look of and the way they play I kind of enjoyed. I say clever moves. Maybe we watch Nottingham Forest feed Liverpool if that draw happens. I'd be fine <laughs> with that happen. because Liverpool on Friday yep. uh, got a result of their own, defeating uh, Everton yep. at home, Liverpool yep. at home, 2-1. Yeah. Yeah. I know you watched this classic, entire game, yeah? Classic FA Cup third round yep. Merseyside derby. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. All right, you want to talk about that one then? Yeah, I mean, we should start by saying, I guess you got to say thumbs up to Virgil van Dijk for not not too shabby of a debut. He Ew. scores the winner in the Merseyside derby in the FA Cup third round with that header. He had a couple opportunities to score the winner before yes, he, he eventually scored the winner. Uh-huh. And I think about... Uh, who is it? Janino who moved? Or no, Sarvas, Marcelo Sarvas, who moved to DC United. Mm-hmm. And like we saw him get the penalty at the beginning of the season of the season opener, missed the penalty. Oh yeah, and yeah. it's really hard, I think, in that moment to not see that. Were as, we there like, for that? Yeah, yeah we, okay. we were. It seems like a very long time ago, yeah. right? But it's hard, I feel like, in that moment to not see that as like a metaphor for the season, <laughs> where it's like, oh no. And so for him to come in, uh, Mir, the Wolverhampton, uh, yeah, 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 Rafa, yeah, he came in and had a header that was just barely saved. I know. And you know that he was. No, like, it was oh. I think it was headed wide. It was headed just. I'm wide. I'm willing thing, to give him credit for the idea. That I think it was headed wide, yeah. but I think in the moment I thought maybe it was safe. Uh, but either way, like, didn't go in. I know you that. want those to go in because <laughs> that's the better story. Yeah. And I, I think Liverpool fans have to be pleased that Virgil van Dijk eventually got his name on the score sheet. Since we've mentioned it, in case we didn't mention yeah. it again, Wolves nil, Swansea nil. Yep. That's going to that's gonna be um, a replay. That'll probably be it for so us. So yeah, van Dijk gets the winner, yep. uh, kind of late, because he was a centre-back that went up for a corner. Uh-huh. Um, at 1-1 I think Matip also jumped with him and for a moment I couldn't tell which one of them had got their head to it right? they both kind of went up and caused problems for Pickford wasn't it Pickford came out mm-hmm. and didn't get there because Van Dijk is huge some, some goalkeeping errors this weekend for sure some goalkeeping errors but I'm going to say thumbs down to teams that send their centre-backs forward for corner kicks when they're 1-0 up. Because I would argue that after Liverpool take the lead through that James Milner penalty, um, there was no need to send Van Dijk and Matip forward for a corner kick later on. Because then when Everton break, it ends with the Guilfrey Sigurdsson goal. Mm Because Everton can stream forward. And the only two guys back were, I believe, James Milner and Andy Robertson. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do as good a job of defending as, say, Matip and Van Dijk would. And the extra evidence I would lay on for this is you even see, during the move, Van Dijk has sprinted back he is determined to try and get back as best he can he ends up pointing to Robertson go track Jagielka because that's the guy who's up there to uh, mm-hmm. to receive the, the pass that eventually ends up with Sigurdsson and Robertson doesn't quite do it correctly and you know that Van Dijk would have done the right thing right yep. so they all end up sprinting falling back that ends up creating enough space for them to be able to open it up for Sigurdsson to step up into and score yeah it, it's it's a. It's I'm a, also very aware this is not a popular opinion well I, I mean I don't think it's an unpopular opinion either I think it's it's unpopular in the sense that you always think, yeah, but if you're only 1-0 up at that point, that's not really a safe lead. If then Everton suddenly come back and win 2-1, do you mm-hmm. look back and think, oh, we should have taken those opportunities? The larger question that I would then ask is, but is a corner really that much of an opportunity? Yeah, and that's, that's kind it. of the age-old debate that, again, I think the study from – uh, the numbers game is that what like only one in eight corners actually ends in even a shot on target, right? And then even fewer, I think one in eight of those shots ends up but a goal. So it's like a one in sixty-four chance off of a corner. And I'd love to see the stats on teams that score after defending yep. a corner kick because it seems like a prime opportunity for a counter attack, right? Because yep. I think I tweeted that your centre backs, your defensive centre backs, are the most they'll ever be out of position mm-hmm. if you send them into the opposition six-yard box for a corner kick. Mm-hmm. And I remember first having this thought. Um, at the Azteca after Michael Bradley had put the US 1-0 up mm-hmm. uh, remember last summer yep. and then we sent Omar Gonzalez and I can't remember who the centre-back was forward for the corner US conceded on the counter yeah I mean and I think 
I can still understand it if you want to send your center backs forward. I think what teams have started to try to do uh, is like keep actual defenders back, though, still, because mm-hmm. like Liverpool kept Hamas Milner and uh, Robertson back, <laughs> yeah. right? But I've seen like in seasons past, I remember Manchester United used to keep Wayne Rooney and Anderson as their two <laughs> defensive players back on a corner. And I think the difference is teams, as we've talked about previously, are starting to use defending corner kicks as a way to launch an attack mm-hmm. and it's been very effective for uh, Man City come to mind and yep. Liverpool come it's to like, mind it's like pulling back the slingshot yeah. right ready yeah. to launch it and yeah. so I think I don't necessarily agree with you that like sending set, both your center backs forward is a mistake but I also don't necessarily disagree with you either. It's a sort of like, <laughs> yeah, I see what you're saying. I can still understand why you'd want to do it. Yep. But it is sort of if you do that, you can't then be angry when you get caught out on a counter. I mean, the pros and cons are all in this game, right? There's Liverpool conceding yep. from that. Mm-hmm. And there's Liverpool scoring the winner there by doing that. Yeah. But I'd argue if you're winning, there's no need to risk it. And I do, I think I tweeted this as well. Maybe I am getting kind of cautious as I get older. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's, just, it's just your willingness to defend Big Sam. It bleeds in. <laughs> I want to say, though, from one more thing from this game yeah. is this all might have been a moot point if Everton were playing with 10 players. And I would argue that they should have been playing with 10 players for a large chunk of this game. Because I think Mason Holgate could have been sent off in this, this one. Is this for the, the – pe- no, not for the penalty. The penalty no. was a penalty, right? He yeah. sort of grabbed him, put his arm across. Mm-hmm. This is the Firmino push. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and while we're talking about things that I forgot, I should also add, yes, I know Per Metersacker scored for Arsenal. Still had a bad mm-hmm. game overall, so I don't care. But in this <laughs> game, Mason Holgate not just concedes that penalty, yes, but then there's the incident in, like, I think it was the 40th minute uh, where Firmino you know, like basically ball going out of bounds. I think Mason Holgate, it just seems like a red mist moment. That's all I can see is just he just gets momentarily frustrated. Firmino's like like running towards the sideline, and Mason Holgate just gives him that last shove at the end, yeah. pushes him into – I mean, I wouldn't even say it's exaggerated by Firmino. I think he loses his balance and goes into the stands, and you see him come back out very angrily. Mm-hmm. And that – uh, maybe I'm biased because of what happened last week where I felt like maybe it could have been a red card on Holgate for his tackle on Jesse Lingard. Yes, I remember but, you texted me about this, right? You were kind of irate about but, it, well, understandably. It's, it's just, it's Ish. more so, this is the stuff that Dele Ali used to do all the time. It would be do, having a good game, doing smart stuff, and then just momentary, like, a punch to the stomach or a shove in the back or yeah, a yeah. kick out that doesn't need to happen. But eventually you start, that starts to get identified. Yeah. And I would say that the next time Holgate clips somebody, mm-hmm. you could see it as a red card because that happened to Leroy Fair this weekend. That yes. suddenly a cynical kick out could get you a red instead of a yellow. Yeah. No, actually, that might start happening. Leroy Fair's was a second yellow. It was, it was a second yellow that turned into a red. I believe it was a straight red. Was it really? It was a straight I red. I thought it was a second yellow. Either way, I'm kind of glad he was sent off because a Wolves player had earlier yeah. been sent off, so it kind of even the, mm-hmm. the score. And Wolves are under pressure. From what I could yep. tell from the highlights I saw, Wolves mm-hmm. were very much under pressure at that point. You are yeah. correct. Um, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention um, the possible racism that happened after yes. that Holgate mm-hmm. shove. So as I understand it, Firmino came back running his mouth at Holgate. Um, Holgate, very angry, later said to the referee that he'd used a racial slur against him. As I understand it, I think the what I read before we came in the studio was that the FA are going to investigate it. I'm mm. not sure if Merseyside police are also going to get involved. I think all I can say is I hope that's not true. Yeah. I really hope Firmino hasn't done that. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I, it's, it's not for us to kind of pass judgment on what happened because we can't lip read. Um, Firmino's lips were also blocked uh, by the for referee's like four head seconds, I think, on yeah. the, uh, the video. So you can hear saw, him definitely curse. And I don't speak Portuguese. Yeah, you can, well, you can definitely hear him curse in Por- or see him curse in Portuguese. Mm-hmm. But then there's a point when the camera blocks his face. And I yeah. think that is when Holgate gets really angry and grabs the referee because that yeah. stood out to me, that he definitely grabs the official. Yeah. And that in and of itself could have been a card, uh, if not a red card there. So I think maybe that is where people are saying there seems to have been some inciting incident yeah. in Yeah, enough for Holgate moment. to get that angry, right? Mm-hmm. But yes. So we don't know, we don't. so we're going to have to wait and see what comes of this. But I would still say that the shove into Firmino happens before any of that sort of alteration yeah, yeah. occurs. So it's not... Yeah, you're just trying to like, separate those incidents out. I do, I do, just because I don't want people, if, who haven't seen it, to get this idea that like, oh, Firmino said that, and that's why he shoved him that makes sense it's more like he shoved no, Firmino Firmino came back definitely said something about his mother then allegedly said something else and that's where then there was even more of a fracas than there already was we'll take a wait and see approach on that that which works I think for me the sensible thing to do indeed all right, today's show, Taylor, is sponsored by an apron, which you could wear, and that apron would be blue. That is correct, my friend. <laughs> I had blue apron tonight for did dinner. You really? I did. Before you came to the studio? I, in, in, indeed. I, I actually have had two different blue aprons delivered in the last two weeks, mm-hmm. and it's been a wonderful change of pace because after the holidays, 
You don't eat the best is what I found there. Even the greens tend to not be as green as maybe they should be, I feel like. <laughs> they tend to be like baked with cheese <laughs> or baked with butter or something. <laughs> They've been boiled. So it was, it's nice to get like fresh vegetables, fresh green stuff. What'd you get? What'd you get? Uh, what did we have tonight? We had a steak and potatoes and kale. All That's right. That's nice. Not, there's some green. Uh-huh. And then I believe that we've had like general sows, but it was like a healthier general sows. I've never had general sows that didn't sort of make me feel immediately guilty <laughs> as I took a bite. General sows healthier, brother? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> healthy so. Colonel so. <laughs> yes. But there have been lots of good, like, like still delicious but still healthy meals that I very much appreciated. Well, that's because mm-hmm. Blue Apron is the leading meal kit delivery service in the United States. You're not wrong. Uh, with healthy, fresh ingredients. Um, as I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, like, me and my wife both vegetarian. So we do the vegetarian option for Blue Apron. The thing we had recently was... Japanese ramen with shiitake mushrooms, yes. which included a thing I'd never heard of before called black garlic. Yeah, we spent about five minutes researching it before yeah. doing today's show. Well, it is. It's weirdly like fermented or something, so it's regular garlic. For like six weeks? Yeah, That's but weird. a weird process has happened to it, and it, it's like it's slightly like more vinegary or something. It really adds a lot of flavor to the bowl. I was really excited about it. There we are. So that's an ad in every Blue Apron, but it was at least in that one. <laughs> and that is the key point there as well, that they expose you to different ingredients, different yes. combinations that you wouldn't otherwise uh-huh. know how to use or want to use. But they find a way to make you use them and make you use them successfully, generally speaking. A couple of recipes coming up mm-hmm. um, the um, Whole30 which I believe is a type of diet I'm not fully familiar with it right. Whole30 approved chicken and kale orange salad with spicy tahini dressing I love a tahini dressing uh, and maybe one that's going to be coming in my Blue Apron box vegetable fried rice with togarashi peanuts so I'll be finding out what togarashi peanuts are alright Daryl will be finding I'll report that out back. <laughs> that works if you would also <laughs> like to find out uh, Blue Apron is treating the Total Soccer Show or Total Soccer Show listeners to a $30 off first order if you visit blueapron.com slash TSS so so check out this week's menu and get your $30 off with free shipping at blueapron.com slash TSS. Cool. Can I say the last part? You may. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. There we are. Well done, Daryl. <laughs> well done, Blue Apron. Now, back to some thumbs up, thumbs down. Where should we go next? Yeah. Oh, okay. So we've done Arsenal Forest. We've done Liverpool Everton. That's about it. Forest Arsenal. Sorry, yep. right? It was uh, Forrester at home. Let's go. Thumbs up to Ilkay Gundogan. And Sergio Aguero for the quick thinking on Manchester City's equalizing goal. Oh, that's yeah. where you want to limit it? Because you could kind of broaden this out further. But yes, let's start with that one. I'm going to say thumbs up to Master Set Piece Theatre. Because oh, that yeah, okay. is what this, their, their, uh, is, right? their equalizer was yep. it? Yeah. So yeah, they were 1-0 down um, from the Ashley Barnes goal mm. in the first half. Uh, I could say but maybe a quick thumbs down to Stones for what oh, he did on that I goal. want to say with that... While we're talking about that, I'm going to say thumbs up to Claudio Bravo and John Stones for reminding Pep Guardiola how good he has it right now. <laughs> because there was definitely moments last season when this is what it was like, oh, we played so well, yep. and then Claudio Bravo kicked the ball out of bounds. Did and you they see that? Under off. a oh, little yes. bit of pressure, he yes. tried to play a square ball to someone at left back. I think it was Otamendi was out there, and he just missed it and put it behind for a corner. Barnes nearally scored from the resulting yep. Uh, corner kick. And then this yeah. one was what a uh, a goal kick for Burnley that mm. then John Stones whiffed, and that's what allowed yeah. uh, Ashley Barnes in behind. Good pressure from Barnes. Yeah. Barnes sort of made him make a quick decision. I guess yeah. we're, we're doing this game chronologically now, I guess, because that well, was just, all in the first half. No, I'm yes. good with it. I'm well, I'm just saying, yes. Yeah, so that was maybe not great, mm. but then we saw all of the hallmarks of Manchester City <laughs> come shining through very quickly. Yeah, so um, I can't remember who it is, but someone takes a heavy touch and then manages to get fouled going after their own heavy touch. So mm. Man City have um, a free kick. Ashley Westwood is standing in front of the free kick, which is what, you know, a lot of professional soccer players are kind of told or trained to do that. It's a smart thing to do because you Mm -hmm. slow down the play, right? Because normally what happens then is that the guy taking the free kick um, is going to ask the referee, hey, can I get 10 yards? And then you can sort of slow everything down, let your defense get set up, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what the Burnley defense are doing. They're sort of waiting for Ashley Westwood to force them to ask for 10 yards. Then they can all get set. But instead, Ilka Gundogan doesn't ask for the 10 yards. He lets Westwood stand where he is. Aguero spots what's going on. And because Burnley aren't set, there's a mm-hmm. massive hole in the middle of their defence, right? Because they're all kind of starting to cluster mm-hmm. around where the cross would come in. Aguero darts into that open space. Gundogan plays a through ball. It's 1-1. Yes. Two other points there. Number one, watching this game and not knowing the result, you could see like this moment was just so ripe for a like quickly taken set piece because, uh-huh. yeah, all the Burnley players are really just walking towards their own goal, backs to the play, not really paying attention at mm-hmm. all. And it's just so obvious that a quickly taken free kick is going to cause problems. And I think, to your point, yeah, Sergio Aguero spots it and spots it well because what he does is goes to the top of the 18 and then he puts his hands on his knees. As if he's waiting, right? But then like it's the same fluid motion is how he like then starts the run. So he goes to put the hands on the knees and that almost like leans, makes him lean 
board. On it, right? And so everybody's like, oh, he's waiting for the set piece to come in. Uh-huh. It's weird that Sergio Aguero's up here for the, oh, he's running away. That's not good. <laughs> and then he's in, and it's a goal. Who's the sneakiest, Sergio Aguero or Eric Lehigh? Sergio Aguero, yeah. I think, for, if for no other reason than because they did this seconds later and it worked out just fine. <laughs> the uh, the City go-ahead goal to put them up 2-1 to one is an Ilkay Gundogan back heel into the path of Sergio yes. Aguero, who makes a really, really, really smart run. And again, this was like the hallmark of Pep Guardiola at Man City. Just pass, 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 quick passing, yep. really good running off the ball, confusing runs. D- defenders don't really know what's happening. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, Sergio Aguero is in a 1v1 situation, rounds the goalkeeper, puts and it in. for this goal, I'm going to say thumbs down to Nick Loughton. Yeah. The Burnley right back. He's the guy that um, intercepts um, a pass from the... Who's the Ukrainian left back? He's in the scout network. I've got his name written down somewhere. Alexander something. Zinchenko. Mm-hmm. So the Zinchenko pass. Lauten intercepts it and he's like, yeah, got it. I got you. We did the Burnley thing. We stopped you coming through. Starts to dribble forward. Man City do the Man City thing and they sort of counter press, right? When the other team has mm-hmm. the ball. I think Silva tackles him. The ball pops loose. It's good to see David Silva back, by the way. It is, yeah. So Silva tackles him. The ball pops loose. And then Aguero's on it fast, right? Finds Gundogan, then makes a, Aguero makes a run through. As Gundogan back heels, Lauten has dropped behind the rest of his defense because he's after making the mistake, he's like thought, oh no, I've got to get back in position and mm. defend this. He's broken the offside line by about four yards, which allows Aguero to run beyond the rest of the defenders, get on the end of that back heel. So Nick Lauten loses the ball and then gets uh, then plays Aguero onside yep. in the resulting move. Yep. And then from there, it just gets worse for Burnley. Oh, yeah. Libra Sanai with a goal and uh, Bernardo Silva with the other goal, I yep. believe it was. 4-1 to one to Man City. <laughs> for that Some one. pretty stuff. For that Silva goal, I want to say thumbs up to Nick Pope, the Burnley goalkeeper. In, he disagree. For, for inventing a new position. Oh, you, goodness. You've heard of the sweeper keeper? Yeah. Nick Pope was the sweeper right back. I'm going to say Nick Pope was the... <laughs> and Leroy Sané burned him for it. He went around him. second-guessing goalkeeper is what I'm going to say, because yeah. he came out and then was... It really was a Ricky Bobby, oh, no, I'm flying through the air right now yeah. moment. of like, uh-oh, I am out of my goal, and I am <laughs> yeah. not getting this ball. So here's this the most impressive good. thing for me about this game from a Man City perspective, is that in the first half... Burnley did their Burnley thing, right? Mm-hmm. I think Man City had like way more of the ball, had more shots, no shots on target. Mm-hmm. All the shots, I think, were from like outside of the box or from really rough angles, which is part of what Burnley do, right? Mm-hmm. They were like, they were compact, but not too compact. They were sort of um, uh, tight, but not too tight. They were like stepping a little bit high, but just blocking off lanes so they, would, they wouldn't let you through. They made it really hard for Man City. They scored that one goal from the mistake, Ashley Barnes. They were very burnley ing. They were 1 0 up. But Man City still found a way with a quick thinking set piece and then with the counter press. I might disagree with you, or maybe giving credit where credit is due, I'd say the match of the day commentators might disagree with you, uh, pointing out that in those first like 10 to 15 minutes, Burnley really went after Man City. And that's why you had. Had mm. uh, Claudio Bravo passing that ball out of bounds is because true. they kept pressing forward and pressing forward. Yeah, yeah. And it yeah was, but they never overcommitted in a way that was sort of this like, is true. oh, we, we're in trouble, we've left holes at the back. This is true, but I still think it is sort of like the, what I think uh, future Man City opponents should take away from this is maybe do that for 10 minutes, but not 15 minutes because they will find a way through eventually. <laughs> don't be scared, right? You, well, well, be, be a little bit scared. Don't be scared, but also be a little bit scared, yes. <laughs> it's like punch the bully in the face, but then back away. Yes, yes. <laughs> we should probably keep it moving. Uh, speaking of maybe bad passing, I'm going to go to Coventry 2, uh, Stoke City oh, 1, no. the game that got Mark Hughes uh, a vacancy? <laughs> a lot of free time? A lot of free time, yeah. Yeah, but Go I'm going to say off. Jeff Cameron helped in that regard. Uh, I'm going to say thumbs down to Jeff Cameron's passing. Uh, should note that for uh, Coventry's opening goal, it comes from, I think it's a corner that goes to the back post that's headed back across, that's eventually headed home. Mm-hmm. Jeff Cameron is the one who's challenging for that initial it's head Jordan back across. Willis. And he misses that header to Jordan Willis, exactly. But I am more frustrated by he has uh, an attempt to pass out of the back. He like, kind of dribbles forward. He has that moment of like, hey, guys, I got this. Brilliant. I'm, I'm in control. I'm going to dribble out of pressure. Then I'll pass the ball forward uh-huh. and instead passes it into his own play. He was back and back for about three seconds. For about three seconds. <laughs> and then, I mean, who was the player who let him off the hook? Uh, Mark McNulty. I've got thumbs up to him for yeah. showing mercy to Jeff Cameron. But I mean, Jeff Cameron <laughs> literally passes into his own player and then sort of stands there and is like, whoops, yeah. as Coventry go back the other way, the ball goes just wide. He does it one more time. He does it one more time and then really does. It's a credit to him because he, he does it one more time and then gets back into position to clear the ball off the line. Mm-hmm. But first, he just passes it straight to a Coventry player. And then what's even more unforgivable is does the sort of like, oh, man. And like head back, lean back. Like, no, no, no. You have just given the ball away 20 yards from your own goal. Go, Go do something. <laughs> Luckily for him, he gets back into position. Unluckily for him, subbed off in the 52nd minute for Peter Crouch. Ooh, so yeah, not, not a good day for Jeff Cameron. Not a good day for Jeff Cameron. And now he's got a new boss to impress. And he's a center At back sort point. of in his sort of yeah. 
mid thirties now. He's getting there. Is he thirty two? Yeah. So he's got. To, he's gonna to have to make sure to win his job with the next guy. I would say so. Speaking or of he, the next, or he's gonna be um, getting a designated player contract in Major League Soccer. Also that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> speaking of the next guy, I'm gonna say thumbs down to Mark Hughes, unless you're Ryan Giggs. Ryan Giggs is the three to one favorite. The presumptive, to take over the job. presumptive nominee. I think he is the favorite every time somebody gets sacked. We'll see what right? happens here. He's the most famous uh, manager not with a job. Yes, and I'm sad to see Mark Hughes go because it is always number one sad to see somebody get fired, uh-huh. but it also like it felt like he. At times, he, he won't f- be like short of something to eat. You know what I mean? I mean, no, and he'll definitely <laughs> won't be short of employment. He'll get another gig fairly soon, yeah. I would guess. He's, he's part of the merry-go-round now, right? Well, he yeah. certainly is. But it's just, it still felt like there were times when he had assembled a squad and kind of got them playing, and it was like, ooh, Stoker exciting. Mm-hmm. And then this season, what this was, uh, his, he's lost the last six of eight games. Definitely seems like it was maybe time for him to move on. Absolutely. All right, I've got from this game, yep. thumbs up to the aforementioned Jordan Willis. This is the Coventry centre-back who scored the first goal for a proper <laughs> old-school centre-back performance in Coventry's win over Stoke. Because here's what he's got. He's got a goal-line clearance from Duf um, in the first half. He like sprints back and like does that thing where you're hurtling towards your own goal and you've got to stop it, right? You can't just watch it go in. So you've got to project, project. You've got to sort of propel yourself at the ball but managed to get around it and clear it off the line. It's hard, right? Mm-hmm. Does it. Keeps Duf out. Then he goes and scores that header, right? Big towering header, uh, beats Cameron, goes 1-0 up. Then later in the game, he has a clumsy tackle on Ramadan to give away a penalty kick. That's some classic British centre-backing. Um, and then right at the end, after getting cleared out by his own keeper, he's sort of injured, hobbling around in the box, but he manages to jump up and put his butt to a shot from Jadon Shakiri to block it. So all kinds of centre-backing from Jordan Willis. FA Cup hero. I'm glad you're pleased. <laughs> I'm glad you're pleased with that overall performance. Um, I'm going to say I've got a few more quick yeah, hits from it. the FA Cup. I'm going to say uh, thumbs up to Danny Williams for uh, playing until the whistle uh, in uh, Bolton's 1-1 to draw with Huddersfield. Did they win 2-1? Oh, did they win? Yeah, Danny Williams' goal was, was, was the second goal. It was 2-1. There we yeah. go. Uh, but it was basically, I think the Bolton players all thought there was about to be a foul called. Yeah, yeah. They all stopped. Danny Williams did not. He runs through, lashes that ball, takes the deflection, yep. ends up in the back of the net. <laughs> yeah, so 2-1 uh, to Huddersfield in that game. I've got uh, from uh, Wigan v Bournemouth, which finished 2-2, thumbs down to Dan Byrne for bullying Emerson Hindman. Okay. So if you've seen this game, it finishes 2-2. Emerson Hindman's back, right? I'm, I'm sure we've got a scout report from Richie Garcia later on, right? I bet we do. So actually, I'm going to save this. I'm not going to mention it. I'm going to save it for the scouting report. We'll talk Emerson Hindman later. You want to do that? On. You want to hold off on it? Yeah, we'll it? hold off. Okay. We'll hold off. We'll keep, we'll keep the scouting report where it belongs. All right. We haven't talked Man United yet. Uh, yet. Have you got anything for Man United's win over Derby County? Uh, yeah, I'm going to say thumbs up to whatever good deed got Jesse Lingard this sort of a hot streak. I don't know if he like, saved the <laughs> leprechaun or what happened there. but Saved the leprechaun? I mean, the give goal, you wishes if you the go- I, I don't think so, but I just feel like maybe <laughs> they just gave him good luck. Okay. Because the goals he has been scoring of late are kind of absurd. This goal, no exception. Suggest to me there's no luck involved. There's just that Jesse Lingard has finally, like, you know, a few things have clicked and he's sort of in his moment. I mean, yeah. I, I do I do think there's something to be said for when you are in that scoring form mm-hmm. that you don't second-guess yourself. You just back yourself to, to do what you need to do. Yeah, yeah. And when you don't have that momentary half-second, like, ooh, should I shoot this as you're following through? Uh-huh. It, it tends to <laughs> work out better than when you're second-guessing yourself while shooting. So I watched this Lingard goal, and the impressive thing I thought was how he managed to find the space. Yep. Right? There were a lot of Derby players around, and he just kept moving, kept moving, mm-hmm. and found that gap to receive the ball so that, so that he had that space to do it, turn, yep. and smash it. Yes. I mean, so that's really well done to him. I would say also well done to Romelu Lukaku for getting on the scoring sh- score yes. sheet. Uh, but also it starts with Paul Pogba yes, hitting about a 90-mile-per-hour ball uh, and then Lukaku settles first touch. How many other players would like – just end up sort of accidentally flicking this on or just yep. the ball bouncing off them, right? I or just he, being like, nope, I'm not getting that. <laughs> nope. Yeah, yep. that's, that's one option. Does he sort of take it, on, nope. doesn't he take it on the chest and it kind of pops up, um, which is, you know, an achievement in and of itself to have it under any control. And then he brings it down and then Romelu Lukaku is away. And not long afterwards, the ball's on the back of the net. Yeah, he's away. I think it's a one-two yeah, with yeah. Uh, Anthony Martial. Mm-hmm. Mar- it's still like he like gets the ball behind him a little bit, but is able to finish it. Yeah, yeah. 2 no Manchester United. Uh, good result for them, certainly. And then... And I think that might be about it since we're not going to do Bournemouth, at least from the FA Cup. Okay, final one for me. Um, thumbs up to AFC Wimbledon. Okay. Um, thumbs up to AFC Wimbledon for getting back to Wembley once again. Okay. So <laughs> I was like, what is there to be giving them a thumbs up for? So they sure. lost 3 0 to Spurs, mm-hmm. third round of the FA Cup. I did enjoy right. Ryan Bailey just angrily tweeting about Mauricio Pochettino, like starting. 
a lot of yeah. his key players. I mean, Harry Kane got a goal yeah. in this game, so we know he was on Ryan JBL was yeah. not pleased. <laughs> so if you, if you don't know about AFC Wimbledon, they were a team that was formed in, I believe, 2002 when the original Wimbledon FC got moved to MK Dons. A lot of fans said, nope, we do not want any part of that. We're going to start our own team and we're going to make it as good as the old Wimbledon FC was, right? Part of the Wimbledon FC story um, is kind of the reason Vinnie Jones is so famous is that they upset the whole... Uh, order of things in England by winning the FA Cup in 1988 they beat Liverpool 1-0 Vinnie Jones was in that game Crazy Gang? The Crazy Gang no that was exactly the Crazy Gang they beat this great Liverpool team 1-0 FA Cup final at Wembley right? Yeah. so FC Wimbledon got back to Wembley uh, when they won the playoff to get promoted from League 2 to League 1 in 2016 but but every time AFC Wimbledon goes to Wembley it's a reminder that they are sort of recreating the Wimbledon FC history even if you lose 3-0 and it wasn't the FA Cup final it was a third round game against Tottenham I still always think about that that like FA Cup winning uh, team as sort of like yeah they won but it's also like if you were playing a team where everybody might have a knife like you'd be like you know what you guys just go ahead and score I don't know what Vinnie Jones is gonna do he looks crazy do whatever you gotta do man. <laughs> So there you go, thumbs up to... Um, oh, from that game, also, thumbs up to Jan Vertonghen for living the centre-back's dream. Have you seen that goal? So, AFC... Uh, oh, no, I haven't, actually. AFC Wimbledon's Lyle Taylor sort of dribbles around a couple of Spurs players, but then Vertonghen sort of steps, wins the ball off him. It must be like 40-something yards out. Takes a couple of steps forward and just bangs it top corner. This thing is like on a rope, as if it's like a zip line going straight to the top corner. There we go. So it's kind of like the centre-back's dream to just like, stop a dribbly player in their tracks and be like, nope, this is how you do it. Step forward, zoom, goal, 3-0. Well done. Yeah. I, I actually didn't watch that one because I remember you talking about which games you thought were going to be captivating, and this was one of them, and I went to turn this one on, and it was like already 2-0. I was like, All right, <laughs> I'm, I'm good on this one. Daryl, you lied to me. Uh, do we want to do more thumbs up, thumbs down, or should we do our final sponsor of the day first? Let's do our final sponsor Alrighty. of the day. It's They're a back. returning champion. Yes, sir. It is Woven, mm-hmm. spelt W-O-H-V-E-N. Simple, elegant designs, nothing busy or tacky. That Just is- ask Daryl Grove, because much like I ate Blue Apron this evening without recognizing that we were doing a Blue, blue Apron ad, Daryl is wearing a woven shirt. <laughs> we're living that sponsored life. We really are, yeah. <laughs> so Woven, you may remember from a few months ago, they are a t-shirt company where for either $15 a month for a graphic tee or $11 a month for a plain tee, they will send you a t-shirt every month. Here's why it's so affordable for quality t-shirts is they get one graphic design that they sort of, you know, they know them, they trust them. That graphic designer creates a woven style design, which as Taylor said, is kind of simple, elegant. It's my kind of thing, right? Not too busy. There's no big logos. There's just a really nice graphic design. Print those t-shirts, send them out to everybody who subscribes. And that's how they're able to do it for $15 a month. That's not bad. So yeah, then if you want to do that same option, you can look like Daryl Grove. Yep. So he does right now. He's got a cactus and a sun on his shirt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, you can dress like Daryl and Taylor because yeah. we'll be receiving a woven T-shirt every month as well. Everybody who signs up gets the same T-shirt. There we go. So simply choose if you want a blank or a graphic tee, then sit back and watch the stylist garments roll in every month at a fraction of what you would pay in the store. And that is definitely true mm-hmm. because otherwise, you're getting like. The Target shirts, no disrespect to Target, they're a wonderful store. <laughs> but you get those same ones that you're like, there's that, always that chance that you're going to walk into the place and yeah. three other people are wearing that exact same uh-huh. like Wolverine shirt or something. <laughs> Woven, it's, it's a bit more unique. <laughs> so also, the great thing about Woven is the fit. Mm-hmm. So they've got, um, if you go on their website, they've got a fitting guide and you literally can track height and weight and it will tell you which t-shirt size you should get and I double check this to make sure that my t-shirt size matched because I'm kind of in this weird large slash extra large area where sometimes XL is too big and sometimes L is way too tight um, extra medium is the phrase Taylor uses yep. if I walk in with a very tight t-shirt on I, um, I, I checked my height and weight which for those uh, keeping stats out there is 6 foot 200 pounds um, and I was just in the XL and that's what I get in woven and it's the perfect fit but if you've just started a new year's resolution that maybe involves your physical fitness the, the like woven tracker chart also, it's kind of a good way to like track your weight loss to be like, oh, I moved from XL to, to large by moving two boxes over. Because you can, um, once you do a subscription, you can change it. Yeah. You, go. you can change size, you can change style, V-neck, crew neck, all that kind of stuff. There we go. So you go. can also get some money off. You sure can. You can get 25% off your first tee by using the promo code TSS2018. That's at woven.com. Where could we put the link? Perhaps a link in the show notes. A link in the show notes. That's the perfect place to put it. There we good go. Good idea, Taylor. So thank you to Woven for sponsoring today's program now back to the thumbs up thumbs down moving Ooh. away from the fa cup shall we yeah there's just the one more for me anyway i've got two it's in mine's in la liga mm-hmm. it's shaq moore shaq moore played right back against barcelona um 
He lost 3-0. He did. But it wasn't all his fault. It was not. I would say it wasn't his fault at all, but okay. we might disagree on that one. I'm going to say thumbs up to Shaq Moore for not doing anything too wrong. Uh, he got <laughs> consistent praise from the commentators and the supporters alike. I saw a lot of people being very pleased with everything he did. I'm going to say I was especially impressed by how attacking he was against Barcelona. Mm-hmm. For a young right back, you expect him maybe just to stay home a little Hit bit more. Forward, yeah. But because I think Jordi Alba kind of went on some marauding runs because Barcelona pushed people forward at times. I think there was opportunities for him. I would say he even could have gotten on the score sheet. He had a shot that was just barely saved by uh, Andre... Like, oh, I always get that one wrong. Is it Ter Stegen? Stegen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I Wasn't was he... Marc-Andre Ter Stegen. I see, I'm, I'm a little less generous for this. To me, he looked like a right back in a scoring position. The way he sort of didn't really like put any disguise on it. He just kind of side-footed it in the corner and Ter Stegen was like, yeah, I see what you're doing. And I'm, I think re- I'm going to save that. I think the reason for that is because the guy who had the ball that passed it to him took about three seconds too long. Like, oh. Shaq Moore was wide open. I think, it was, I think it was Jason. I've watched this like 40 times to try mm-hmm. to get the number of the player, but I still couldn't see it sharply enough and I can't claim to know the Levante squad that mm-hmm. well. But he basically gets the ball... More, more familiar with them he gets the Shaq. ball on what would be his, like, his left side of Barcelona's box and kind of comes in the middle as Shaq Moore runs down the right, is wide open and is sort of screaming for the ball. Jason yeah. continues to carry and carry and carry. And I think if he plays that ball a second or two sooner, there's a little bit more opportunity for disguise from Shaq Moore or Shaq, as he's listed. Did you notice uh, that um, in the La Liga graphic, which yeah. is the official La Liga graphic, which is what being sport get, it's, it's, he's listed yep. as Shaq. Yeah. I don't know if that's kind of like a Shaquille O'Neal was Shaq and like you've got that name, so you're famous. So I'm, let's, guessing, let's he's give you that name. I'm guessing he's chosen it. I yeah, think I hope he so. Shaq I hope you get back. to choose your own nickname yeah. in La Liga. Yeah. But I would say that if that ball's played earlier, he can do a bit more with it because it's played when it is, because he's approaching it the way he is. Maybe you could argue he could have changed that, but yeah. I would say. All he can really do is take that first time. Otherwise, Mark andre Ter Stegen uh, maybe <laughs> is, is going to have more of a difficulty with it. What do you think about Shaq Moore's involvement in Barcelona's first goal? So if you haven't seen this, it's easy to mm-hmm. find. Um, it's Messi scores the goal. Really nice finish from Messi. Messi essentially clips a ball over the top of the Levante mm-hmm. defense to Jordi Alba, who's kind of marked by Shaq Moore. Alba then nods it back into the path of the advancing Messi. Messi kind of meets it in the air and softly volleys it into the far corner. Yeah. It's a very nice goal, but I wonder if Shaq Moore could have cut out that first clipped pass that ended up on Alba's head. I don't think so. Cause how, how do you think he could have done that better? Just go and meet the ball and head it clear. You I, mean, I mean, but it's played over top of him, right? So, yeah. he's, so he's trying to keep a line. So if he, if he drops back to try and intercept that ball, now he's kept other players on okay. the side, right? Yeah, so I felt like part of the... If you're going to put blame on it, it's that it's as if he's just assumed that Alba's going to let that ball drop and Moore's like taking a defensive position of like, all right, I'm going to contain you here. Mm-hmm. Doesn't think that Jordi Alba might just nod that back, right? Well, I think this is one of those scenarios where because, because it's an American, we're much more inclined we're to be too harsh. focused on it. Yeah. I think so because to me this is really no uh, different than the Leroy Sana goal for Man City, mm-hmm. where it's basically they got the right back for Burnley in a two v one situation, and he basically couldn't commit to either one. Oh. They're able to move the ball around him. I can't, so that's Lauten again. Right? I actually forgot to mention that when we did the Man City review. Mm-hmm. I thought Lauten kind of froze. I, I think it's because he's trying to mark Leroy Sana, but also has whoever it is who plays that ball chipped over the top. Yeah. He basically can't decide who. I think it's David Silva mm-hmm. that leads to problems. Here, I would say the same thing. Where yeah. Shaq Moore, it felt like his job was like tuck inside, concede the channels. We're not so worried about that. Other people can cover that. We don't want people dribbling through. So he was tucked inside. You've got that overlapping run, and I think he sort of is like, I need somebody else to track that so yeah, I can yeah. keep my shape and when nobody else does. I mean, there's an argument that this is kind of the genius of Messi is that he clipped that ball in a way that Moore maybe yeah. couldn't get to it I would and say also so. made the secondary run to be on the end of the return pass and maybe someone should attract Leo Messi uh, is yeah. the other thing. I would say definitely <laughs> yeah. so. Um, I, and then I think the argument could be made that he is, he does worse for the third goal. Shaq Moore? Yes. Yeah. I He's not know. the only one though. That's the so thing. So essentially Messi has a dribble through the box mm-hmm. and cuts it square for Paulinho to score. And I'd say Shaq Moore is one of about three Levante players that tries to have a poke at Leo Messi and just mostly gets thin air instead. And this is and this is where again <laughs> thin it's like Barcelona air. It's it's bad like it's definitely like you could you if you got the screen cap it could be posterized cuz it is him <laughs> sort of like going for a messy just dribbling right around yeah, him yeah, yeah. but it's it's again it's basically him being pulled out of position because of other players you're yeah, absolutely yeah. right it, he's one of three the other two are uh, Eric Cabaco and Robert mm-hmm. lots of single names on Levante <laughs> but both of them do that sort of like 
I'm just going to stand up and Messi has to go one way or the other and he goes right around they them. They all look terrifying yeah. for Messi. I think that's it is that they don't want to concede a penalty so they don't want to go in too hard mm-hmm. and so they do the opposite and they let Messi dribble around them and then the one that I think is especially bad is I believe it's Kabako then is the first one to get beat by Messi and then so Shaq Moore like kind of does that like half I'm going for the ball but really I'm just trying to force you wide and then kind of comes around to stand him up but Kabako comes charging in and as we've talked about many times with Messi when suddenly two players go all in on him that is when he is going to get away almost always because they both are sort of like I'll get him too I'll get him too two players coming in wildly it means you have two different ways to go with that one Messi's always going to find a spot so how about this for a verdict on Shaq Moore versus Barcelona Mm -hmm. he did about as well as your average La Liga defender so we've I, would got, say, I would say better. I would say better. Okay, I think so you we, got a lot of praise. So we've got a 21-year-old American defender who is at the very worst, um, no worse than any other La Liga defender yeah. when facing Messi. That works for me. <laughs> that works for me. Uh, and then I said I had one more for the weekend. It was about Jonathan Gonzalez oh, and Monterey. That has to you be wanna, the scouting report. You want to save right? that one for the scouting? Yeah. Let's do that yeah, then. Let's save so it shall we move our scouting. attention to the Total Soccer Show Scouting Network, Daryl Grove? If I can find the correct piece of paper. <laughs> well, while you do that. There it is. I'll get it. it started. Yeah. Uh, Elijah Bates scouting Zach Steffen, the 22-year-old American goalkeeper for the Columbus Crew. Zach's stock seems to be continuously on the rise after his postseason heroics. Stefan was included at number 14 on Goal.com's uh, Top 50 Americans in the 2022 World Cup pool. He finished two spots behind Jonathan Klinsman. In addition, he will likely get called to the U.S. M. T. January camp that should be announced Monday and could likely be a starter for that friendly. I'm going to say to Goal.com too soon. Yeah. Unless maybe you wanted some clicks, which I guess is exactly what I've just realized. That's exactly what's happened. Correct. Um, <laughs> um, also, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought that up. The January camp, um, it's going to have 30 names on it. I've been, we've been, We've seen on Twitter. We haven't been like any inside information. Um, we're expecting it Monday at noon Eastern is when it's expected to be announced. 12.05. 12 12.05, really? No, I'm just, that's what it always <laughs> is. So it's a couple minutes later. Um, okay, then uh, we'll have a show on Tuesday, not with Taylor, but with a special guest to analyze that roster. The only two names that I know will be on it right now are Tyler Adams, because someone at New York Red Bulls let it slip, and Christian Ramirez, because someone at Minnesota United let that slip. I know a lot of Loons fans will be very happy to see Christian Ramirez on that roster. Yeah. And they'll say, about time it should have been sooner. There we are. But, so as, as you said, more on that later yeah. on. Uh, for now, reports, yeah. yeah. James Porter is scouting Delhi Ali. We haven't had a report for a while. Um, 21-year-old English attacking midfielder for... Tottenham. James says Deli Heli has snapped out of his early season funk and is currently feeling quite festive with two goals and four assists over the holiday period. While his finishing has been off all year, Ali has been creating at a high level. He's been involved in 10 goals in the last nine games, getting two for himself, five direct assists, two MLS assists and one penalty that he drew which I, Daryl Grove, am counting as an assist. There we are. I did notice this, Ali was laying on a lot of goals for teammates uh, over the festive period. Well done, Deli. Well done, James. Well done, John Fernandez, scouting <laughs> Uh, Borja Mayoral, the 20-year-old Spanish striker for Real Madrid. Oh, we got to prove again. John says, you guys seem to like haikus, so keep them coming. Just because we read them does not mean we like them. <laughs> Copa del Rey time. Cross from Atraf, strong header. Borja scores again. <laughs> Isn't it Borja? Borja, yes, excuse yeah? me. Yes. Oh, you ruined the haiku. <laughs> I got it right the first time and messed it up the second. <laughs> Odd. So, well, you, got, you got covered, right? Both right that's good. Uh, thank you, John, for the haiku. When I, when, good. I, when, when I edit this show, I will no longer have made a mistake. <laughs> Haikus are good because they're nice and short. Yes. Yeah. Um, Michael Bite is scouting Tiana Davidson. This is a new um, assignment. 19-year-old striker for Stanford. Stanford Cardinal won the College Cup um, and the U.S. Women's National Team. Good job not pluralizing that. Thank you. Um, Michael Byte says, Tiana Davidson has been called into the U.S. Women's National Team camp of 20, for 2018, first camp of 2018. So yeah, the Women's National Team has a January camp as well. They'll be playing Denmark. This comes after a successful there sophomore season There's at the Stanford girl, I know. in which she won, I see, transitioned from a midfielder to a centre-back, two, won the College Cup, I believe I already mentioned that, and three, won a whole bunch of awards, including first team All-American. She'll now hope to get her first cap for the senior team as they face Euro runners-up Denmark in San Diego, which will also hopefully lead to her getting her own Wikipedia page. Apparently, she doesn't have one. Maybe that's maybe that's why you you failed to note that uh, this had already been filed. Maybe because there's no Wikipedia page. Once that happens, <laughs> we'll be good. Uh, John Zaldana is scouting Declan Rice, it's eighteen not, year old. It's not the reason. I know, eighteen year old Irish center back, uh, central uh, defensive midfielder for West Ham. Declan put in another solid shift this time against Spurs in a one to one draw to round out the Premier League festive period. He went the full ninety in his natural position of center back in a defensive oriented. Three five one one. 
Does that work? Yes, that works. Okay. Uh, Declan's solid <laughs> run of form. Yeah, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Declan's solid run of form is drawing specific praise from manager David Moyes, uh, as well as other media outlets. But my favorite, says John, uh, by far came from the official Ladbrokes Twitter account, which said, when 18-year-old Declan Rice gets home and empties his pockets, phone, keys, wallet, Harry Kane. <laughs> Put him in his pocket. <laughs> Stephen Brandt is scouting Christian Pavon, the 21-year-old Argentinian winger for Boca Juniors. Stephen says Juventus and Manchester City have also been following the versatile wide forward, but Arsenal are understood to be closest to pulling the trigger. Um, Boca would be willing to part with the academy product for offers starting at £20 million, £20 million pounds, um, but won't be willing to countenance a sale in January as they wish to make an all-out assault on the Copa Libertadores. That works. Uh, Todd Brennan. So I like this. Christian Pavani is being scouted by Stephen Brandt, Juventus, Manchester City, and Arsenal. So Stephen's in good company there. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Todd Brennan scouting Cameron Carter-Vickers, 20-year-old American central, center back, on loan at Sheffield United from Tottenham. Oh, yeah, I've been waiting for a report on CCV. It's been a while. It's going to be a lengthy one, but it's a good one. Okay. The congested calendar wasn't the best period for Cameron Carter-Vickers. Uh, it began well enough with him playing the full 90 in the Blades' 3-0 win over Sunderland on Boxing Day, but four days later, he was subbed <laughs> off after only 31 minutes in the Blades' 1-0 draw lost to Bolton, largely because of the play of Anthony Robinson. Was CCV injured or anything like It just seems like you're not doing so well, get off? It might have been. I don't know for sure, but it might have been that starting a back three, recognize it's not working, that switch to a back sense. four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on New Year's Day, CCV did not see the field in a one-to-one draw versus Derby County. Why not didn't a he great, look? Not a great birthday present. What? Why didn't he look? <laughs> not a great birthday present for CCV, on, who turned 20 years old the day before. Carter Vickers did, however, <laughs> return to the starting lineup this past Saturday and played the entire match in Sheffield United's 1-0 win over Ipswich Town in the third round of the FA Cup. Hey. In addition, it also sounds like there's a small chance that CCV does get recalled in January. A very small chance. Okay, so uh, Americans still in the FA Cup include CCV with Sheffield United. And also... Keep reading. <laughs> Richie Garcia is scouting Emerson Hindman, the 21-year-old American midfielder at Bournemouth. Um, Richie says, Emerson Hindman went the full 90 in his home debut in Bournemouth's 2-2 draw with Wigan in the FA Cup. Emerson scored for the other team. It wasn't completely his fault as the ball deflected off the wall from a free kick in the 30th minute. Richie listened to the game live on the AFC site. That's Bournemouth. And it sounds like Heinemann had a decent game, but gave the ball away a couple of times when under pressure. Mm-hmm. So I think it was in my scout report that I had a good look at this free kick. Right? Yep. So the Wigan player taking the free kick is Nick Powell. Remember him? Former Manchester United um, hopeful, I'm going to call him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, next to him was Dan Byrne, who is a six foot seven English centre-back, was standing next to Emerson Heinemann in the defensive wall, mm-hmm. right? So Dan Byrne is pushing Heinemann, pushing and shoving, and he's much, 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 much bigger and stronger than Emerson Heinemann. He's trying to push Heinemann out the way to create a hole in the wall um, that Powell can shoot through, right? That's the, the goal of Dan Byrne. Mm-hmm. Heinemann decides, I'm not going to be pushed around by this big bully. I'm going to fight back. So they end up in kind of a pushing match, and it ends with a shove from Byrne that kind of doesn't move Heinemann completely out of the way. So he's in the way when Powell shoots. It bounces off of Heinemann and goes past his own keeper. Yeah. Hence the own goal. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with you on that. I just still think it's always tough. Like, even when it's, cr- like... Technically correct, the best kind of correct. The own goal, you mean? Uh, yeah, it still feels weird to the say like kind of a, a ball that deflects off of a person in the wall can be counted as an own goal, even though I understand why it is. Yeah, yeah. I would say, though, that to your point, when you get into that kind of shoving match, you're no longer 100% focused on yeah. that free kick And taker. you don't have the straight body shape as well, right? I can't yeah. remember the exact angle that it hits Heinemann at, but I bet if he was standing straight forward... It would just hit his chest like Matthew McConaughey sh- in the Wolf of Wall Street. shoulder, I think. Yeah, so yeah. there you go, from being shoved around. Or if he'd just been like, all right, Dan Burns stronger than me, I'm not going to get in a wrestling match with him because yeah. he's like the undertaker and I'm going to lose. But I would say <laughs> I had in my initial uh, remarks a reassuring thumbs up for Emerson Hyman because, yes, he plays the soccer. own goal, but because he had the MLS assist for the equalizer. Did he? Bournemouth went down 2 know that. Came back and drew 2-2. And the final, yeah, the final goal comes from a Mark, Hugh, uh, Mark Pugh cross for Steve Cook's equalizer. It's ah. Emerson Hyman with the ball in the middle he plays it out wide then that ball comes back in happy days are here again there we go the future of American soccer Emerson Heinemann is back in business one of several I believe (laughs) but I'm with you Uh, Keith Kombach up next scouting Federico Swervi Valverde the 19 year old Uruguayan central midfielder on loan at Deportivo La Coruña from Real Madrid that's the longest title I think we have (laughs) Swervi has been doing mediocre at best Uh um 
which swerve, I think, h- swerve harder. I think, as Harris Whittles would say, at best, uh, <laughs> and ignore the first part. Uh, the only moment worth mentioning was his foul that gave away, or would have said, I guess, Harris Whittles said. The only moment that worth mentioning was his foul that gave away a penalty against Barcelona. While it was a penalty, Luis Suarez definitely embellished a slight tap to his foot, but Messi missed the resulting penalty, so it all works out in the end. Up next, Luis Mitchell Jr. is scouting Jonathan Gonzalez, the much-talked-about Jonathan Gonzalez, 18-year-old American defensive midfielder at Monterrey. Um, Luis says uh, Jonah started Monterrey's season opener, Mexico Liga MX is back in action, a 1-1 draw with Morelia. It was an overall solid performance with a few wrinkles. He had several near assists <laughs> before his deflected shot eventually led to a Funes Mori goal. It definitely seems like he's going to be doing a bit more attacking this year. Lastly, no new news, no new news, on Mexico's latest efforts to recruit Jonah. Mm-hmm. Okay, I saw this. Yeah. Um, it was sort of a shot that was very much blocked yep. and just sort of looped in the other direction. He's not going to get any credit for this. No, he's not. But I do take Lewis's point that this is Jonathan Gonzalez yeah. trying stuff yeah. right, as he sort of matures into his next season at Monterey. He definitely seemed a little bit freer in his role. Like, I didn't see him so much always in that, like, number six defensive anchor spot. I saw mm-hmm. him rooming around a little bit and having yeah, yeah. people cover for him. I would his, say, though... His heat map's interesting. He's got the number six heat. I saw his heat map. Yeah. Uh, and then he's also got, like, a weird, like, slight attacking midfielder yeah. heat. Like, yeah. patch. You know, those patches of dark heat. It makes me wonder if maybe they were really trying to go for this. It's the season opener at home. Yeah. They're the defending, what, regular season champions? Regular season thing. champion. Uh, runner up. Gila yeah. runner up and Copa Emeki's champion. There we go. Possibly so, the best team in the league. Uh, and so this would be, I would say, an upset that they drew one to one. I think the equalizer coming like the 97th minute. Oh, I watched it. It was a penalty given away very, very yes. late. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to say my only other note to this one is thumbs down to Morelia's number 10, Diego Valdez, because when Jonathan Gonzalez, I think it comes from a corner that's partially cleared, and then Gonzalez has that shot that's deflected, and everybody else from Morelia steps except for Diego Valdez, who does that sort of. I'm reacting to what the ball is doing and not thinking about my responsibility because he kind of like hops around and is trying to see what's happening and stays at about the six-yard box and literally keeps on side four players from Monterey, including the guy who gets the assist, uh, which is Jose Bastanza, and Funes Mori for the goal. Both of them kept on side by that move. Doesn't Bastanza do some very centre-backy stuff as oh, he's yes, trying to bring he that ball down? <laughs> oh, he's goodness like, gracious. It's almost like he's shepherding the ball out when you're yeah. defending, but instead he's trying to keep the ball in play, and it weirdly somehow works. Barely, but yes. Yeah, it really was just sort of like, I'm not sure he knows what he's doing, but it worked out in the end. Uh, yes, so. Two more reports. Um, Elijah Chappell is scouting Joe Willock. Sorry, I've stolen your... It's it was right. your turn to read, right? Uh, scouting Joe Willock, the 18-year-old English central midfielder for Arsenal. Elijah says, Joe was part of the Arsenal team that was put to the sword by Nottingham Forest legend Eric Lehigh. Willock started in central midfield but had a poor game and looked out of sorts before being subbed off in the 65th minute. I've just realized the big thing we didn't talk about from the Arsenal Forest game is Kieran Dahl's penalty kick. Well, oh yeah, the the what attempted double touch or like like he a, def- so, alleged double touch? So I've watched it several times and not attempted at I all. can't always Accidental. see it. it's an attempted left footed strike, yeah. right? But he slips and hits it with his left foot into his right foot. I'm Does pretty he confident. though? I can't tell he did. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think he did based on the direction the ball goes in. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, that's the thing, though, is I can't tell because I don't know if he was going for that sort of, like, just chip down the middle and mm-hmm. maybe just fell while doing it because when you slip, it tends to go up, as we know. Yeah, but does uh, it go straight if you hit it with your left foot? I would still just say, like, to the people who want there to be VAR, I know they're going to be trying it out next week, I think it was. I think there's a, a third-round game on Monday involving Crystal it Palace. Is. I can't remember who the opponent yeah. is. It's going to be run as a trial in that game. It may be in the fourth round as well. But I don't Too think, late for Arsenal. I don't think this would have gotten overturned because I, don't, I still don't think it it was clear enough one way or the other oh, I see. That's to really say like yeah definitely because I watched it being like oh here we go I'm excited so too did the commentators and it was sort of like mm, maybe but I can't say for sure it seems like if anything he hit it at the exact same moment I'd also say to Arsenal fans and actually no Arsenal fans are claiming that the whole no. game turned on that right no. it really turned on the sort of the fake offside trap they yes. were running for yes, me. <laughs> <laughs> Final report is a happy one. It comes from Stephen Hernandez scouting Keaton Parks, the 20-year-old American midfielder for Benfica. Keaton Parks was subbed on at the start of the second half in Benfica's match against uh, Morenense. Uh, this was his second appearance in a league game, and he helped seal a 2-0 win. It was 1-0 when he subbed on. He put in some strong tackles and looked comfortable with the ball at his feet. Oh, one, one thing I saw from this report, I yep. saw it when he came in. I was really happy it came in a lot, not long after full time in that Benfica game, and I really love keeping tabs on Keaton mm-hmm. Parks. I'm really thankful that Steven sent it in he said that the uh, the feed he was watching was kind of blocky and pixely 
But Keaton Parks was still really easy to yep. pick out because he's this big, tall dude with blonde hair. Six foot four, I think it is, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Six foot four pixel with blonde hair. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> so thank you to Stephen. And thank you to, deep breath, Elijah, James, John, Michael, John, Stephen, Todd, Richie, Keith, Lewis, Elijah, and Stephen. I stumbled a little bit towards the end, but it wasn't bad. It Indeed. wasn't bad. Well, I think that's for me to say, but sure, why not? <laughs> Thank you to everybody who has submitted the Scouting Reports. If you'd like to join the Scouting Network, support the Total Soccer Show, it's totalsoccershow.com slash join. I did a lot of assignments over the weekend. There should have been a lot of people getting their scouts in their inboxes. I'm going to put this call out again. If you would like to receive your scout this week, please email me, Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L, at totalsoccershow.com. Let me know that you are waiting for your scout. I will send it to you this week, I promise. Alrighty. Sounds good. I won't be emailing you, but I'm sure other people will be. <laughs> I, you'll be texting me at least. I bet sure. you'll get an email from you this week. That's probably true. <laughs> Final thing we should mention, we are definitely now going to the United Soccer Coaches Convention in Philadelphia, right? We're going to be there January 16th to the 20th, getting yep. involved in all that good stuff. We're also going to be having a live show on the evening of January 18th in Philadelphia, um, we're alongside George Qureshi from Howler Magazine. It's going to be a Howler slash TSS co-production, co-hosted mm-hmm. live event. We don't have the details nailed down of the exact where and when, but George has set up um, an email list. We'll put the link in the show notes. If you put your email into the link that's in the show notes for the TSS Howler or Howler slash TSS live event, uh, George will keep you updated on exactly when and where it is. But it's definitely Philadelphia, January 18th. We'll get more specific as we get closer to the date. I always go alphabetical in those situations. So I'll say Howler slash TSS. All right. Well, fine. actually, if you go to this link, it just says dummy. All right. But well, I, think, I think that's just a, a misstep from George. In that case, boycott. <laughs> boycott the event. Yeah. No, don't. Show up to the event if you can. I'm just going to be mute the whole time. <laughs> You'll do a silent protest. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> All right. So, Taylor Rockwell, hey, I've got something to say to you. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. Right back at you, buddy. Listeners, thank you for listening. Taylor won't be back on Tuesday, but a special guest will to talk about the U.S. men's national team January camp roster. 